classes in statistical mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 13, Kirkwood-Wigner Theorem, Chemical Equilibria. Okay, so <clears throat> what we are going to do today is to push forward from having discussed the photon gas a bit. Um, I may, that'd be a good idea. I'm George Phillies, and these are lectures based on my book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics. What we're going to do today is to push ahead from the discussion of quantum systems into the discussion of chemical reactions and the discussion of real particles, that is, particles that interact with each other. So where we will start is a side E, page 0208, <clears throat> and the side E discusses the Kirkwood-Wigner theorem. We aren't actually going to crank through all the mathematical details, but I will explain what is going on in a side E and where it comes from. Uh, the basic issue, um, we've occasionally been saying that there's a 1 over n factorial in the ensemble average. There's a 1 over h to the 3n. Well, that must have come from someplace, mustn't it have? And what, we are go what the Kirkwood-Wigner theorem does is to show you where it came from. Uh, now, the first issue is the equation E.1 is just the ensemble average. That is, uh, the partition function is the sum over all of the states of the system of x minus beta E. That, however, is a classical description. If you want to do that as a quantum description, you have to say that that summation J is really a trace if you choose the um, energy, the states of the system, the complete set of basis vectors to be the energy eigenstates. And then you get something that looks sort of like equation E.2 where um, if you put in the energy eigenstates, um, the oper x minus beta e is x minus beta h is an operator. It acts on an energy state to give you a number exponential of minus beta e. <clears throat> and then the energy eigenstates, the bra and the ket vectors, just see each other and turn into one if things have been properly normalized. Well, that's very nice, <clears throat> but that doesn't very visibly give us either the 1 over the n factorial or the h to the 3n. So what happens next? Well, what Kirkwood said is we have an equation 9 point, e.1 point or e.2 and equations e.1 and e.2 are the trace of a matrix. Uh, the Horizontal and vertical, the row and column elements of the matrix are labeled by the energy eigenstates so that, for example, in E.2, the stuff inside the summation sign, the psi n star x minus beta h psi n, that is a, an element of a diagonal of a matrix. Now you could calculate psi n star x minus beta h psi m for m not equal to n, and if you did that, you'd find it vanishes. So q is the sum of the diagonal elements of a matrix, but since we chose the um, bra and ket vectors, the basis vectors, to be the energy eigenstates, all of the non-diagonal elements are zero. <clears throat> so far, so good? Mm -hmm. What Kirkwood did is to say, okay, however, the trace of a matrix is an invariant. If you change the basis vectors and you calculate the trace, you get the same answer that you did before. 
And one of the homework problems was to demonstrate this for a two-state system in which you could have the um, polarization vectors plus or minus, or you could have the helicity vectors uh, plus, plus or minus, minus. But if you calculated the trace, you got the same answer each time. And what Kirkwood did is say, we will choose um, something that is quite different as the basis factors. We will choose the objects given in E.4, and those are plane waves of wave vector P over H bar. That is, those are the momentum eigenstates. The momentum eigenstates are a complete set of states. That's actually Fourier's theorem, if you think about it. Also, in addition to being a complete set of states, they are eigenvectors of the kinetic energy operator. So what Kirkwood did is to say, we will choose a new set of states, and underlying them are the things shown in E.4. And for the kinetic energy, that's E.5, I point out that for the kinetic energy operator, these things are also eigenstates of E.5. Okay. Now we put in the fact that real particles are either bosons or fermions. When I was a graduate student, there was gr some considerable interest in parastatistics, for example, spin one-third particles, um, in which case the symmetry rules get more complicated. But there's signs of spin one-third particles are currently viewed as being a bit thin on the ground. So we'll stay with bosons and fermions, and the important issue of bosons or fermions is that the real function has been symmetrized or anti-symmetrized. So that the real wave function is an appropriate sum of combinations of the E.4s to get a complete object. <clears throat> and the, what, is it, what, what is the permutation? Well, the position coordinates are the R, the P's are the um, momentum coordinates, and if you look at equation um, E.6, it's a sum over all permutations. What's being permuted? Well, for each momentum object, say P sub 1, P sub 2, you have terms in which every single particle coordinate is associated with each of the P's. And if you think about that, since there are capital N momentum coordinates, E.6 is an appropriately symmetrized or anti-symmetrized sum that contains n factorial terms. It contains n factorial terms because um, <clears throat> that's all of the ways you could symmetrize or anti-symmetrize. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the first thing that Kirkwood does is to say, well, let us actually worry about the normalization of this object. E.6 is the actual wave function corresponding to a particular list of P's. And what Kirkwood says is, um, if this is a complete set of basis states, um, then G... Um, it should have be appropriately orthogonal and normalized and all of those good things, right? Mm -hmm. And what he then does is spend the equivalent of e equations E.7 through E.9 and E.10 calculating the normalization constant. And he does that. And the normalization constant has a factor of h bar to the 3n, and that comes out of doing the integrals over all of the p's. And then you also pick up a factor of 2 pi to the 3n, because integral e to the i k r over all k is 2 pi delta of r. And the 2 pi's all come out. 
And the net result is that the 2 pi's and the 2 pi's and the h bars cancel, and you end up, as seen in equation e point nothing, with a factor of h 3n. Well, if you'd divided b properly by h to the 3n, you would have been normalized and you, it would have canceled. So you have to do the normalization. Okay, having established what the normalized, way, normalized basis states look like, these are the momentum eigenstates, but you have a bunch of particles, so you have to symmetrize over all the particle positions. Um, you then get to E10, which is the partition function again. And the partition function is the trace of a matrix. Um, and the reason there is, and the trace, well, where's the trace operator hiding in that? The trace operator is hiding in the integrals over all of the dPs, because the Ps label the momentum states. The integrals over dr are how you take the um, scalar product between two states, two momentum states. Uh, the double sum on p and p prime appears because there's the permutation operator when we symmetrize. Well, there's one of those for the bra vector, and there's one of those for the ket vector, and they're independent from each other. And so you end up with e point 10, which is the partition function. Kirkwood then discusses how you evaluate this. And there's sort of two parts to evaluating it. And one of the parts to evaluating it is to um, pay some attention to how the permutation operators interact. And the other part is as follows. Look on the second line of E.10. There's an exponential minus beta h. H is the total energy of the system. Because H is the total energy of the system and includes the potential energy, it's way simpler if it's only the potential energy, if it's only the kinetic energy, I mean. X minus beta H acts on the um, thing to its right, which is the symmetrized um, wave uh, basis factor. And when it's done, you no longer have the same thing there. You have a mixture of states. Because um, in general, um, the uh, states of the system are not eigenfunctions of H. So H acts on the states of the system, and, or an X minus beta H acts on the states of the system. It's this operator. And since the thing it's acting on are not eigenfunctions of H, when you're done, you have a mixture of states coming out. And so Kirk would ask, well, that's very interesting. How do we fix this? How do we evaluate this? And what he then does is to say, we'll start in the limit of high temperature. And in the limit of high temperature, um, X minus beta H is basically 1. Because beta goes to 0 and E to the 0 is 1. And so in the limit of high temperature, the energy operator is simply the diagonal. And life is very simple. However, how do we get down from um, temperature of infinity? And the answer is implicitly shown. Um, we start with equation E.11. And E.11 says, well, X minus beta H acting on one of those eigenfunctions of the plane waves gives me a function of U. And U is what happens when X minus beta H acts on thing, the things. Mm -hmm. Well. At the limit of high temperature, u is just the original wave function. And what we then do is find a differential equation that gives the, differ the dependence of u on beta, on the temperature of the system. And we then, so to speak, integrate downwards. 
and we get equation E.13, which is how U depends on beta. Oh my, how are we going to integrate that mess? And the answer is, Kirkwood does a series expansion, and, there, and one says there is a term 1, which is the starting term, and then there is a linear term and a quadratic term, and so on and so forth. And how does he find the um, object? Well, he writes out the differential equation for it, and he puts in the, the crudest guesses to the answer into the answer. And if you put the crudest guess for um, u into the answer, namely it's sim u is simply uh, the unperturbed answer, you get a perturbed answer. And he does iteration. Now, iteration, there is absolutely no guarantee that iteration will converge, let alone that it will converge to the right answer. However, it turns out that the series you get is in powers of h, or 1 over h, and it therefore looks encouraging that there's convergence. And he then goes through a fair amount of math that we are going to skip, and generates um, oh, what you see in equation E.20, which is a power series, last term, power series in the correction terms. Now, the one hazard with this approach is there is no guarantee that the correction terms are getting smaller as you generate more and more of them. But it does, but the assumption, pious hope here is that it works, and, um, if you crank ahead and things are reasonable um, and you do the integrals, you in fact end up classically with the classical um, canonical partition function E.22 and you end up with correction terms. I do not show you the correction terms. It's something, it's implicit in the discussion. The correction terms are of higher, a higher order of in H. H is a fairly small quantity, and so you might hope that things worked. Now there's another way of saying this, which is the hand-waving approach seen in many stat mech texts, which is to say that if you have two states of the system that localize the, a particle within delta x in position space and delta p in momentum space, and delta x delta p, the product, is less than about h bar, it's the same state. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It doesn't tell you that delta x has to be large or small. You can make delta x as small as you want by making delta p very large, and vice versa. And the assertion, therefore, is the number of, if you do an integral dx dpx, there are a certain number of states in there, and they're determined by the Heisenberg uncertainty limit. There is, however, one minor complication, which is that the um, if you look at equation E.22 the f on the right, there's a 1 over h to the 3n. And what this is saying is that the appropriate limit on how two states, close two states, can get here is delta x delta px less than h, not less than h bar over 2 or whatever. Yes? Mm -hmm. And that you might ask, well, gee, why is it that limit? And the answer is, if you look at a good derivation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you, have to, you realize you had to put in an arbitrary definition of the letter capital delta. That is, you had Delta is not something implicit in the theory. It's something you put in. You have, say, a Gaussian wave function in x, and therefore also in px, as your wave function, and delta is some measure of the width. Well, it turns out that physics tells you which is the correct width to use. It does this in statistical mechanics, and the correct, if you use the correct definition of the width, the answer is not E.23, but it's 
delta x delta px less than or equal to h. And you get there but not by changing the, st the quantum calculation, by tweaking your definition of the letter delta. So that is it for the Kirkwood-Wigner theorem, which actually tells us where the 1 over n factorial and the h cube, h to the 3n, comes from. We now come to chemical equilibrium. That's chapter 14. Chapter 14 starts out by discussing what chemical equilibrium is. That is, we have a, a series of species A, B, C, D. And there is some way of converting a certain number of A and a certain number of B into a certain number of C and a certain number of D. Chemical reaction. All chemical reactions are reversible. They go to a certain extent in both directions. Now, the equilibrium constant may be very small. For example, if I have a bar of tungsten at room temperature in vacuum, there is a wonderful calculation. This was in my freshman, actually, high school chemistry book. Uh, what is the vapor pressure of tungsten at room temperature other than really small? And it corresponds to about one tungsten atom per universe. So we have our bar of tungsten sitting here. And someplace out in some stray galaxy, there is a tungsten atom. And that is the vapor pressure of tungsten at room temperature. Or so the claim was made. The reason I bring this up is to say you have a reaction. It goes in both directions. It is useful to introduce a progress variable. The progress variable says we are starting here. We are ending up there. Now, if you run a reaction, in general, you could run it either direction, at least formally, and you can only run it so far before you run out of one of the reactants. If you're going this way, you run out of one of the reactants. If you're going that way, you run out of one of the products. However, remembering that you do have this limit, that you can only take the reaction until you run out of stuff that you're reacting, that what the progress variable does is to say, for each increment of the um, progress variable, I will go to equation 14.2 on page 216. And we actually start out with equation 14.1. There's the chemical reaction, Na of species A, Nb of species B going to O, N, C of species C, N, D of species D. The little n subscript i are called stoichiometric coefficients. It's how much material is being consumed or produced by the species. There's a law of nature constraint, which is equation 14.2. And the law of nature constraint says that in chemical reactions, you do not change how many atoms you have. And so if you are consuming Na of species A, well, Na has m sub A, it's written in the equation of m sub I, of atoms of the species we're talking about. And as we run the reaction, well, there's a trick. Um, the n's are written as signless numbers. Uh, however, outside of the stoichiometric co equation by convention, uh, the coefficients on the left side are called positive numbers. The coefficients on the right side are called negative numbers. And if you go, go through and apply high school chemistry balancing equations by making sure that reactants and products match, you get 14.2. And 14.2 simply says atoms are conserved. What does the reaction coordinate do? Well, we're going to run the reaction in some direction. And in 14.3 says, on the right side, we start out with Ni superscript 0 of species I. 
we then run the reaction through an amount xi, and as we do so, n sub i, that's a stoichiometric coefficient, of species i are consumed. Remember, if you're on the left side of, excuse me, the right side of 14.1, the n sub i are negative numbers, and equation 14.3 shows the amount of stuff on the right side of the equation being increased as we run the reaction from left to right. Okay, <clears throat> now we ask the question, how are we going to describe this in statistical mechanics? And the answer is we will stay in the canonical ensemble. And we will write the canonical ensemble for a reacting system. And the canonical ensemble is then a sum over all states of the system. There's only one complication. The amount of each species is not the same in every state. In the canonical ensemble, when we did the ideal gas, in every state of the system, there were precisely capital N atoms of the R monoatomic ideal gas. Mm -hmm. Here we have the complication that while there is a conservation law, the number of atoms underlying is being conserved. In some states, there is more of one species, and in some states, there are, there are less of that species. And I give an example of that, and the first thing I ask is, how do I write the canonical partition function for a mixture of materials of different species? And that's shown in equation 14.7. And what 14.7 did is to say, I have NH atoms of atomic hydrogen and NH2 at molecules of molecular hydrogen. The energies are separable for a dilute gas, nothing interacts. And therefore the partition function has the form shown in 14.7 where the factorials show up because hydrogen atoms can't be distinguished from each other and hydrogen molecules can't be distinguished from each other. Mm -hmm. And so you calculate for each hydrogen atom or each hydrogen molecule separately its full partition function. You do have to be slightly careful of one issue. And the one issue you have to be careful of is that you have to be sure that for all of the objects in the system, the atoms and molecules, you're using the same as zero of the energy. And that means, for example, in equation 14.4, the energy of a hydrogen atom, uh, there is a kinetic energy term. There is a potential energy that might depend on position. And there is a binding energy, which I've just written as the, should be familiar, it's a binding energy. Rydberg energy over the energy level squared. Yep, it's, it's the um, binding level yeah. for the electron attaching to the atom. And then, in 14.5, I write the energy of a hydrogen molecule, which has a, a kinetic energy part and a potential energy part, and there's a vibration and a rotation, and there's also the energy of forming the hydrogen molecule using the same starting point as you would for two hydrogen atoms being mm -hmm. formed. You can choose those places for yourself, but you have to do it. Okay, so suppose we have two hydrogen atoms in a box. Mm -hmm. They have two possible arrangements, and one is there are two isolated hydrogen atoms, and the other is they're a hydrogen molecule. Let's ask what the canonical partition function looks like th for this. Well, if I just told you there are two hydrogen atoms in a box and nothing else, you take equation 14.4 and you turn the crank and out comes the um, canonical partition function for the two hydrogen atoms. Ditto if I told you there was a box with one hydrogen molecule in it, you could turn the crank, in fact this was homework, 
you had to remember all the energy terms in 14.5 to do this, and you could get the partition function for one hydrogen molecule in the box. Well, there's a chemical reaction going on, and the canonical ensemble includes all states of the system. So it includes the two hydrogen atoms in the box, and it includes the molecules in the box, molecule in the box. And therefore, as shown in equation 14.9, <coughs> 14.9 has two terms, one for the two hydrogen atoms, one for the one hydrogen molecule, and there is the canonical partition function for two hydrogen atoms that react with each other and could also be a molecule in the box. And the little q's are the canonical partition function for a single object, because the energy is separable. The um, factorials in the denominator are different because you have to take account correctly in each term of which is indistinguishable from which. If you had four, three or four atoms in the box, life would become more complicated. Okay? Good so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we say, uh, I discuss the uh, partition function, and I point out, as we chug ahead, I go first go through an argument explaining why those uh, partition, why those factorials are the way they should be. It's sort of obvious, but you can also spell it out, and I spelled it out. And now I say, suppose there is a reaction coordinate. Suppose I can move between states of the system. How do I find the reaction coordinate? Well, or the best value, the reaction coordinate. Well, one answer is to say, I will calculate the average value of psi. That is, psi has a different value in each allowed state in the system. And therefore, I can go through and calculate an average psi. And I can calculate a fluctuation psi squared minus psi average squared. That's legitimate. What I instead do is to use a very old argument about, which only works for large numbers of particles, about properties of the different states of the system, that is, different values of psi. And the assertion is that if you have a big system, the most probable state is pretty much the only state that matters. And yes, there are fluctuations around the most probable state, but they're small, and either we can ignore them, or we can calculate their mean square size. Well, the various value as I change psi, I move from one combination of atoms to another, and I am looking for the most probable value of psi within the part the um, ensemble. Well, in the most probable value of psi, psi must be a maximum, yes? That is, p as a function of psi has a maximum. And therefore, if I take d probability of state based on psi, d psi, it must be zero, because I'm at a maximum. If I look at the canonical partition function for each value of psi, and ask what happens to that as I vary psi, it's this very sharply steep peaked curve with this maximum sitting here. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it has a maximum. So we actually calculate, and that is done chugging ahead into equation. Um, 14.15, we actually calculate d probability of state as a function of psi, d psi, and that's determined by dq d psi. It's normalized, of course. 
But how does the partition function depend on the progress variable? Well, it depends on the progress variables through the number of particles of each type, right? So it depends on the number of part on psi as shown in 14.16. And in 14.16, I've inserted an intermediate variable into the dq d psi. And the intermediate variables are all of the ends. So I run the reaction. I change the number of each particles of each species at the same time. The rate of change is dn d psi. And then Q depends on capital N. So far so good? Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, the dn d psi's are the stoichiometric coefficients. And dq dn is something you've actually seen before. dq dn up to constants is... What is it? It's the chemical potential. That is, up to a constant, dq dn is the chemical potential, and therefore, the prod and that's written in 14.17. I write out dq dn, but I realize q is e to the minus beta a, and therefore the derivative of q with respect to, b to n can be written as the in terms of the derivative of a with respect to n. Oh, what is the middle thing in equation 14.17? Well, there's a minus beta, there's a dA dn, which is a chemical potential, and there's a q. Mm -hmm. And the q is the same no matter which n sub i we're taking the derivative with respect to. If you take 1417 and plug it into 1416 and simplify it a bit, you get equation 14.18. And if you haven't had thermo yet, you do not realize you are looking at a totally standard thermodynamic equation. You are looking at a totally standard equation for equilibrium in terms of the stoichiometric coefficients and the chemical potentials of each of the species. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the next few pages actually turn the crank on an example, or we do this for an ideal gas. Rather, a mixture of ideal gases, different chemical species that react with each other. Why do we do ideal gas? Because for ideal gas, we can write out exactly what the partition function is. If we, didn't ha if we had interacting particles, we wouldn't know yet how to write out the partition function in an explicit form as opposed to an implicit integral dr, dp, x minus beta, e sort of thing. We actually, for an ideal gas, can write out the partition function explicitly. The other point on this is that for ideal gases, the partition function, capital Q, is se separable because the energies are separable. And therefore, uh, if I just have a n atoms of the same type, Q, big Q, is simply little q, the partition function for one atom, raised to the capital N power, except I have to divide by n factorial. Well, in general, for a bunch of react for a bunch of ideal gases, the partition Q function Q is shown by 1420. And in 1420, the fact that each chemical species is separately indistinguishable gives us those factorials in the denominator. And the numerators are the partition functions for each of the species. Okay? Well, um, the we can then go through and turn the crank, and the chemical potential is minus 1 over beta dq dn, d log q dn, and 1 over beta d log q dn, we can, it's n of a specific species, we can evaluate 
and the only trick in the evaluation is that we have to use some approximation for n factorial. And we use the approximation that log n factorial is approximately um, g log n n log n minus n. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, that's right after 1421 and we put that in and we do the math and we get to equation 14.23 g logarithm of q over n what's that? Let's take this equation and it's a sum the exponential of a sum is the product of the exponentials. And that gives us equation 14.24. And equation 14.24, uh, gee, um, we can rearrange things. Um, and a trick is to say the number of particles isn't very interesting. n over v is the density. And so we take this object and we multiply it by a power of v. Well, really, we multiply it by 1 in the form v to this weird power divided by v to the same weird power. And we rearrange and we get equation 14.25. And 14.25 has ratios of concentrations to different powers on one side. And it has partition functions divided by the volume on the other side. And that's an equilibrium constant. And you are looking at the equilibrium constant for dilute species. Okay? Mm -hmm. Interesting aside. You probably saw that equation in high school chemistry. Do you remember seeing it in high school chemistry? Do you remember seeing it? And did you take freshman chemistry here? No. I did your freshman year here. I took uh, AP chemistry, and I think I remember seeing something similar. Okay, well, if you had taken chemistry, you would have seen it. And you would realize, gee, this result applies in dilute solutions. <coughs> <coughs> mm -hmm. Well, the reason it works in dilute solutions is the Macmillan Mayer theorem. And what Macmillan and Mayer showed is that if you have a dilute sol solution of different chemical species, you can take all of the potential energies involving the solvents, and you can hide them. And you can hide them as saying the um, so dilute solute species have funny interactions. But the funny interactions are very weak because the sol if it's dilute, the solute molecules are far apart. And you can make a dilute solution look exactly like an ideal gas with respect to this question. It is a very nice 100-page proof, which for some reason I omitted from the book. It, um, it's a very important proof. And what it explains is why dilute solution behavior looks exactly like ideal gas behavior, which had been known for a long time. And there, there were the thermodynamicists who aren't aware of Macmillan and Mayer um, sort of say, well, this, there's this interesting coincidence that the osmotic pressure of an ideal gas, of an ideal sol sol solution looks exactly like the ideal gas law. It's not an interesting coincidence at all. It's a rigorous consequence of statistical mechanics. As Fermi pointed out, if you're doing an osmotic pressure measurement, you have the osmotic membrane, you have concentrated solution here, you have dilute solution here, and if you, measure, if you bring the two to equilibrium, the pressure on the two sides is not the same. And you can test this by having little vertical glass columns and the water rises up one column because the pressure on that side is much higher than the pressure on the other side. And Fermi says, well, it can't be due to the solvent for the excellent reason that the solvent can go right through the osmotic membrane. That's why it's called an osmotic membrane. It must be due to what the solute is doing. And Macmillan Mayer um, proved this 
Phil McMillan's doctoral thesis was complete in about 1943 or 45. And 30-some years later, he was a faculty member at UCLA, and I heard him give a talk sort of on this and a few other things. So it is a, it, this is, however, now two scientific generations ago, going back to Mayer. It's a standard result in statistical mechanics. Okay, we have now finished with chemical equilibrium, and we have now moved, are advancing to part three of the book on interacting particles and cluster expansions. And the second half of the book deals with interacting particles. It deals with particles that move through, that move through liquids. It deals with correlation functions. And we will probably not quite get to the hidden correlations chapter, which deals with the, if you are not careful, unpleasant things can happen. However, this is a natural point to stop, because we have now covered the front half of the book. <laughs>